and tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Welcome to Season 7, Episode 3. If you're just joining us this season, I'm your host, Eric Peabody. This season has introduced a few new changes, with the first being the new host intro and theme music composed by yours truly. And don't worry, I promise we'll stop mentioning this after a few more episodes. We're all just so happy with how everything is going that we want to kind of swim around in it a bit. Before we talk about tonight's story, I'd like to mention that there is a trigger warning for self-harm, so please consider yourself notified. In this ghoulish tale, we are introduced to a fellow named Bobby, who has a weird habit of drinking his own blood, and who will go to any lengths to get even just a small taste of it, even self-harm. But after nearly killing himself to satiate his craving, he ends up in the hospital and soon develops a craving for the blood of others. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today to get instant access from our friends at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Did I mention they were ad-free? Thank you for your support. And now, from author D.B. Anthony, I give you... Blood. He heats the silver blade of his pocket knife with the Zippo lighter he'd stolen from the gas station earlier that evening. The blade begins to blacken as the temperature of the steel begins to rise. Once the blade is fully blackened, he puts a hand towel in his mouth and bites down on it to brace himself for the pain. He then presses the blade firmly against the skin of his left forearm. Bobby knew this would hurt more than simply slicing his wrist with the knife, 
but it was too dull to break the skin, and he didn't feel like searching for another one amongst the unpacked boxes in his new house. Besides, a burn would take longer to heal, meaning he'd have the wound to pick at longer to satisfy his weird craving for blood. Through his own research, meaning a quick Google search while he got bored in the bathroom once, he learned that his habit was called hemophagia, or simply autovampirism, which was apparently a mental disorder. Some websites said it was linked to childhood trauma or done for some type of sexual gratification. He knew his reason was probably the former of the two. His childhood was filled with nothing but trauma, and he didn't get any sexual gratification from it. He didn't know the real reason. He'd done it as long as he could remember, or cared to remember. His body was covered in scars from his bloodletting. Truth be told, he just really liked the flavor of it. The flavor would even change depending on his diet for the week. His blood would be sweeter if he drank only Pepsi and ate sugary foods. If he drank some right after having coffee, he would swear that it gave him more energy than simply drinking the coffee did. Same for energy drinks. If he drank alcohol, well, let's just say his favorite alcoholic drink was his blood after having a handle or two of whiskey. When he first started, it was only a few drops here and there, maybe even a few licks when he accidentally scratched himself, and he'd just pick at the scab until it was fully healed or scarred. He didn't remember when he resorted to self-inflicted injuries, probably about the same time as when he started to grow up and get hurt less frequently, both physically and mentally. He just started to ponder his childhood trauma when he was interrupted by his girlfriend's voice. What the fuck are you doing, Bobby? That one's going to get infected. I thought we were working on this. Sam shouted, her voice sounding more concerned than angry. I'm sorry, babe. It's just with the move and all, I've been stressed. And you know the taste of the blood helps comfort me. He was lying, but she didn't know that. He had her convinced it was some type of a nervous habit he did when he was stressed out. It's okay. I'll fetch my go bag and patch you up, but then I have to get ready for work. Are you going to be okay, unpacking alone while I'm gone? Oh, babe, do I have to? I just want to relax a little. It's been a long couple of days. At least unpack your laptop and get back to work on your stories. I can't wait to read the next one. Her overexcitement for a story he had yet to write was encouraging. He couldn't help but feel lucky to have her. She loved his horror stories, and her being a full-time paramedic came in handy with the number of injuries he'd inflict upon himself. She walked away and came back with the black bag she always kept ready for just this type of situation. Helping save people was her full-time job, even at home, but she didn't mind. She enjoyed the feeling of being important to him and the rush she got from saving people. And now, a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. We're taking a quick break here to show some love to a sponsor that's shown so much to us, BetterHelp Online Therapy. Have you ever been in one of those um, awkward situations? You know, the ones you know you could have handled better? Anxiety can make us react in less than favorable ways at times. Whether it's a confrontation, presentation, or online encounter, hindsight is usually 2020. It's easy to get wrapped up in focusing on problems rather than solutions. That being said, it can be tough to train your brain to stay in problem-solving mode when faced with a real-time challenge in life. But when you learn how to train your brain to find your own solutions, there's no better feeling. A BetterHelp therapist can help you become a better problem solver, making it easier to accomplish your goals, no matter how big or small. 
BetterHelp is online therapy that'll help you deal with life's difficulties quickly, conveniently, and inexpensively. It's helped me through countless situations. Within 48 hours of signing up, you'll be communicating with a therapist who specializes in your unique difficulties. Whether it's grief, stress, anxiety, fear, depression, etc. You can text anytime and schedule calls or Zoom meetings weekly. With BetterHelp, help is never more than a text away. It's professional counseling in your pocket. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash horror hill today to get 10% off your first month. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash horror hill. The only grievance he had with her was the fact that she was trying to fix him when he didn't feel like his habit was that bad. There were worse habits. For example, he could have been smoking or drinking himself to death. All this left him with were scars. You could work on the next chapter of your novel, she said, while dropping the bag on the ground next to him. Yeah, I don't know. I think I might scrap it. The whole premise just feels a bit childish. Childish? There's nothing childish about the chapter where the closeted bully bashes his homophobic, alcoholic father's brains in and then lights their house on fire. Besides, I need to know how it ends. He laughed as she wrapped up his burn. Her constant encouragement was the only reason he hadn't given up on being an author and why he had published his first collection of stories in the first place. Hell, if not for her making him publish them, they probably wouldn't have been able to afford their new house, and he probably wouldn't even be alive. She became a paramedic partially because of him. They had met in high school, and she had been patching him up ever since. Though he thought she was smart enough to be a doctor, she decided she liked the rush of being an emergency responder and having an ever-changing work environment. Sam finished patching him up and kissed him before leaving for work. He was now alone with his thoughts in unfamiliar territory for the first time since high school. He decided to take Sam's advice and try and find his laptop so he could work on another horror story. He opened the boxes labeled Office and was digging around in them when the craving for his blood began to kick in. He found his letter opener in one of the boxes and took it into the bathroom with him. He stripped off his clothes and looked at himself in the mirror, looking at all the scars he'd acquired over the 25 years of his life. He unwrapped the latest wound to add to the collection. He examined the burn. It looked like he had burned straight to the muscle tissue. He planned on digging the letter opener into it to make it bleed, but he decided he didn't want to bear that much pain twice on the same day. Besides, the letter opener's two-inch blade was sharp enough to slice his skin with barely any pressure or effort. What's one more scar amongst the countless ones he already had? He plugged the bathtub drain and started to let it fill with water as he attempted to relax. He played with the letter opener examining its every detail. Sam had bought it for him as a reward for publishing his first book. It was pure silver, and she had had it engraved in cursive with the words, for opening your future fan mail. It always made him smile when he read it. He hadn't received any fan mail yet, at least not that he knew about, because he hadn't checked the P.O. box he had opened for that since he published the book. He was too scared it would turn out to be hate mail instead. The fear of people hating his work kept him from publishing it in the first place. He started to remember the harsh criticisms his abusive stepfather had given him back when he was a teenager and had found Bobby's old notebook filled with the stories he had just published. He could remember that day very vividly. It was the first time anyone else had ever read any of his horror stories. His stepfather, an author of mostly Christian and religious literature, 
never thought it took much talent to write horror stories. He made his disgust of the genre well known when he burned Bobby's collection of R. L. Stein's Goosebumps books and whipped him for reading Stephen King novels when he got older. He even despised horror movies. He'd always go on rants about how anyone associated with the genre was a Satanist or a cultist. Every time a new horror movie premiered, he'd petitioned the church to ban it from the local cinema, to, quote, protect the community from satanic imagery, unquote. So, when he discovered that Bobby was avidly writing horror stories, he damn near killed him. Bobby began to picture that night in his head. What the fuck is this? This garbage? His stepfather shouted. It's my... Bobby's response was cut short by the notebook being thrown into his face, knocking him to the floor and giving him a bloody nose. You untalented heathen! These stories are abominations! His mother ran in to see the commotion and screamed in horror at seeing her son with a bloody nose on the floor. What the fuck did you do to my son? His mother's anger had taken them both by surprise. She had never come to her son's defense before. I'm teaching this godless, no-talent heathen what happens when you worship Satan in my house, he replied while taking off his belt. He beat Bobby half into a coma that night. When his mother tried to stop the beating, he knocked her out with one quick strike and continued the brutal onslaught of beating a defenseless preteen. Every hit came with its own insult. His stepfather's insults continued to fill his mind as he pressed the blade of the letter opener to his wrist. He closed his eyes and began to apply pressure. The words kept echoing in his mind as new voices joined in with new insults. Tears began to form in Bobby's eyes as he slid the knife across his wrist, not realizing he had accidentally applied too much pressure until it was too late. Blood began pouring out of the fresh cut faster than he had intended. The water began to turn red as the blood trickled down his wrist and into the tub. Shit, 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 he shouted while trying to reach for his phone. He dropped his phone into the dark red water, his wet hands letting it slip out of his grip like a bar of soap. Fuck! In a panic, he quickly jumped out of the tub, turning the white and blue floor tiles red as the mixture of blood and water splashed. Sprinting to the living room to try and find the house phone, he remembered that they hadn't even set up home phone service yet. He sprinted back to the bathtub and tried to find his phone in the dark red water as the blood flowed out of his wrist, dripping off his arm and beginning to pool beneath him on the floor. His vision blurred as he finally felt his fingers brushing his phone. He managed to grab his phone before falling over onto his side. Squeezing his phone, he tried to activate its emergency SOS feature, but wasn't sure if the phone was even working as his vision faded to black. Unsure of how much time he had been unconscious, or if the whole situation had just been a bad dream, he woke up in a hospital bed with his wrists restrained. Bobby, oh, thank God you're finally awake! He heard Sam's voice shout excitedly from his left. Uh, what happened? Where am I? He replied in a dazed, confused state. You're in the hospital, baby. You cut too deep. The doctors say you almost reached the bone. That's why I told you not to do it without me present. Her voice was stern, but didn't hide her concern. A guilty feeling began to rush into Bobby as he could hear the disappointment and fear in her voice. He looked into her bloodshot hazel eyes and saw that she had been crying. I... I know I fucked up, and I'm sorry. You know me, I'm usually more careful. I just got lost in my head. You don't know how scared I was. 
My first call of the day was to my own home, and I found my boyfriend lying on the bathroom floor naked, not only in a pool of his own blood, but next to a bathtub full of blood. You're lucky Apple gave iPhones the emergency SOS feature. I lost that much blood? He asked. Yeah, I had to give you some of mine during transport to keep you alive. Then, at the hospital, they had to give you even more. Also, my partner saw you naked. All he can talk about is the size of your... It's whatever. At least he isn't talking about all the scars or the situation. Well, he wouldn't be the first gay guy that's jealous you have me. She laughed. Yeah, he keeps jokingly asking if you'll be up for a threesome with him and his husband when you recover. And I'm pretty sure he might have taken a picture. They both laugh. Anyway, baby, we need to talk. From her voice, he could tell she had bad news. They wanted you to stay here under suicide watch and be admitted to the psych ward. I tried to convince them you aren't suicidal or a danger to others, but that was a little hard considering all the scars you have from self-inflicted injuries. Damn, and here I was thinking I could go home and write a story about this. I'll bring you your laptop and other necessities, and I'll visit every day till you can come home." The next few weeks were tough for Bobby. He was under constant watch, and the doctors and nurses checked him every night for new wounds. The therapists tried to make him talk about his childhood and any other issues, but he would either avoid the subject or make up stories about how good it was. By week two, he began to get easily agitated and started showing some withdrawal symptoms that he tried his best to cover up so the doctors and Sam wouldn't notice. His skin was pale, and he began to look like he wasn't eating. The cravings were hitting him like an annoying itch he couldn't scratch. He needed his fix like a junkie needed meth. He had two wounds on his arm he could just simply open and drink the blood from easily but they wouldn't let him even look at them most of the time, forcing him to wear long sleeves and cover them in the shower. Their thought was, out of sight, out of mind. But that wasn't working for him. He wished he could go back in time just to taste the blood from the cut. He could have consumed the gallons of blood that went to waste on the floor or down the drain. By the start of week three, he was trying to bite his tongue until it bled, but he could never bite down hard enough or long enough without the nurses or doctors noticing. He was being driven to his limits, and Sam was the only one who knew him well enough to notice. She told him to focus on his stories, and it would take his mind off it, but writing a bloody horror story where someone else got to satiate their cravings wasn't appealing. When Sam came to visit on the Wednesday of week three, she acted differently than normal. What's wrong, Sammy? Bobby asked. Before answering, she carefully looked around the visitor center. Nothing, baby. I just... I, um... Well, spit it out! Bobby snapped, drawing the room's attention for a moment. Keep it down, Bobby, or I won't be able to give this to you. Give me what? Before answering, he felt Sam pass him something under the table. Looking down, he saw a manila envelope that he quickly stuffed into his pants pocket. Don't open it yet until you're alone, she whispered. Okay, but what is it? You'll see, baby. I volunteered to be on standby for the high school hockey game, but I have to go back to work tonight. I love you, and I miss you. Before he could say it back, she had already given him a long kiss and hug goodbye and walked away as if she was scared she'd get in trouble. It would be a long couple of hours for Bobby as the contents of the manila envelope dwelled on his mind. What could she be so nervous about that she didn't even wait for me to say I loved her back? He thought out loud. What was that? The nurse asked while walking in. I asked if it was shower time. He replied quickly. Yes, it is. I'll replace your bandages and cover them up for you. 
then you're good to go. The nurse seemed to take her time rebandaging his wounds, and Bobby was trying not to get visibly impatient with her. Of course, he'd get the new nurse without warning on the day he had something to open in the bathroom. It's like whatever god there was was playing a practical joke on him he didn't have the patience for. When she was finally done, Bobby practically leapt off the hospital bed into the bathroom. He quickly opened the manila envelope he had in his pocket all day, and a letter dropped out along with a liter of blood in one of those hospital drip bags. He picked up the note and began to read. Dear Bobby, These past few weeks without you at home have been painful and lonely. I miss you so much. Watching you suffer in that hospital has been hard for me. I've tried convincing the doctors to let you come home and that all you need is me, but they say your erratic behavior points to some type of withdrawal. I now understand why you do what you do more than ever. So don't ask me how, but I got this for you. Don't worry, it's my blood, so it is clean. Just try to pace yourself so you can get out of this hospital prison and back home with me, where you belong. Love, Sam. Bobby kissed the note as if he were kissing Sam to thank her. He quickly bit into the bag of blood like a predator that had just caught its first prey in weeks. He tried to pace himself, at first, but once the first drop hit his tongue, he couldn't help himself. As he drank more, he began to notice the difference in the flavor of her blood compared to his. Hers tasted far superior to his. The difference was like Pepsi compared to bargain brand cola. He assumed it must have been from her mostly healthy diet and active lifestyle. Before he could enjoy the taste any more, the blood bag was little more than empty. He tried his hardest to get the last bit out, to no avail. Suddenly, the nurse knocked on the door. He looked at himself in the mirror and noticed the color of his skin had begun to come back. He also noticed his teeth and lips were red with blood. Are you okay in there? She asked. Yeah, I, uh, I just had to take a dump first, he replied. After a quick shower and a quick check for any new wounds or evidence of an attempt at self-harm, The nurse left him alone so he could try and fall asleep. He couldn't, however. He now couldn't get his mind off how perfect her blood had tasted. He knew she was perfect, but not that perfect. The next day when Sam came to visit, her eyes lit up with excitement when she noticed how much better he looked after one night. I can't believe that worked. You look so much better than you have in these past few weeks. The doctor said the nurses have been telling him how well you've been doing today, and that if you keep this up, you can be home by Sunday. Her voice was as excited as her eyes were. Yeah, thank you, baby. I know this must have been hard on you, and I've missed you more than anything, even the blood. She blushed. Out of curiosity, how did it taste? She asked. As perfect as you, my love. Blushing even more, she responded with another question. Do you think that'll get you through till Sunday? Um... You drank the whole bag, didn't you? She asked, slightly annoyed. You know me so well. That was supposed to be a four-day supply, you jackass. She sighed. (sighs) You're lucky I love you. I'll try to get you another bag before visiting hours end. No, you don't... I want you home, alive, and I want you healthy. If this is what it takes, then so be it. Only an hour would pass before she returned with a fresh bag of blood in hand for another visit. Only this time she was less nervous about smuggling it in. She passed it to Bobby underneath the table, and he shoved it into his pants pocket just like last time. 
Thank you, baby. Don't thank me. Thank the hospital for lax security around the blood bank. I was able to walk in and out, no problem, she said confidently. Ah, you robbed a bank for me? Bobby responded jokingly. Yeah, so just be careful, okay? That may be clean blood, but it's from some random person. Later that night, when it was time for a shower, he took out the new manila envelope that was hiding the blood bag and opened it. This time, he was a bit more hesitant. Was he really resorting to drinking some stranger's blood? He thought to himself. He looked in the mirror and began to ponder if other people's blood tasted better than his own, or if he had just been that blood-starved. There was only one way to find out. To taste the blood in the bag Sam had given him. Cautiously, he bit a small hole into it, only big enough to let out a few drops at a time. He then slowly pressed his tongue to the new blood like a child trying new food. Once the taste hit his tongue, he immediately bit down on the bag, accidentally spraying some on the floor. He impulsively and quickly began to drink the whole bag. Once it was gone, he started to lick the blood off the floor. Oh my God! The nurse screamed. She had entered the bathroom to check on him and found him with human blood dripping down the sides of his mouth. She tried to turn and run out of the room, but tripped over her own feet. She hit her head on his bed, knocking herself unconscious and causing herself to bleed. As if instincts took over, Bobby impulsively ran over to her body and began dipping his hands into her blood and licking it off his fingers. He then began to wonder what blood would taste like directly from the tap. The nurse had just begun to awaken when Bobby forced a pen into her jugular and began consuming the blood that poured out. She tried to fight him, but he was too strong. She tried to scream, but he had already taken the pen and shoved it into her vocal cords. She was absolutely powerless to stop him. He knew this was wrong, but he couldn't stop himself. The blood tasted too good. He began to hear voices outside the door, and he panicked. There was now a dead body in his room, and he was covered in its delicious blood. In his head, he estimated he probably just consumed about three gallons of blood, maybe more. However, it wasn't enough. He wanted more. Not only that, he wanted more straight from the tap. He grabbed the pen and hid it on the hinge side of the door, ready to attack the next nurse or doctor to walk in the room. The door opened and he heard a scream, followed by the doctor quickly calling for help as he got down to check on the nurse. This attack had to be quick. Bobby pounced on the doctor and quickly stabbed him in the jugular twice and began consuming his blood. This male doctor seemed as powerless to stop him as the nurse had been. With the blood not flowing out fast enough, Bobby bit down as hard as he could, ripping the doctor's throat open even more. Doctors and nurses began to rush to the room, to the chaotic scene, and were powerless to stop him. Bobby slaughtered and drank the blood of anyone that crossed his path. He felt like an invincible god. Alarms started blaring as patients and doctors tried to flee the psych ward. The under-equipped and under-trained security guards tried to stop him to no avail. Blood began to decorate the walls and floors of the hospital halls. It wasn't until the first cop shot at him that Bobby finally halted his onslaught, taking cover around a corner. Look, man, I don't know what you're on or what you're not on, but I know you are a danger, and I can't let you leave this hospital or this psych ward alive unless you surrender, the officer called out. 
Bobby looked around at the mess of blood and bodies he had left in his path to the exit. It looked like a scene out of one of his horror stories. How did his weird habit result in this? All right, to get out, I clearly have to go through you, but you have a gun. I would rather not die, so I guess I surrender. I'll come out with my hands up and back turned to you. Please don't shoot me. He complied with the officer's demands and stepped out of the corner with his hands up and his back turned. He listened to the footsteps as the police officer approached him. All right now, I'm going to cuff you. Now to do that, I have to holster my pistol. If you try anything, I will be forced to use lethal force on you. Bobby silently nodded his head. The officer was clearly a rookie, so he just had to wait for the right moment to strike. He listened closely as the officer lowered his gun to place it into the holster to cuff him. When Bobby heard the pistol click into place, he quickly spun and grabbed the officer's arm away from his hip and ripped his throat open with his teeth, biting directly into his jugular. Bobby began to hear the voices of more officers approaching on foot, and the tires screeching of even more arriving in cars with lights and sirens blaring. He began to flee down the stairwell. He didn't care about where he was going to hide or how he'd get anywhere. All he cared about was where he'd get his next fix. Hours had now passed since the hospital and there was a town-wide search for the person responsible. No one had pieced together what had happened yet. Bobby had managed to escape by following other surviving patients and doctors covered in blood. No one had seemed to notice that he was covered the most. They must have been too petrified. He managed to find his way safely to his backyard without anyone knowing. He picked up the key under a fake rock he had placed rather stupidly on the back porch where there were no other rocks. He knew it was kind of dumb to put it there, but he figured the last place anyone would look for a fake rock hiding a key was the single rock on the porch by the door. He hadn't even gotten the door open when he heard her voice. Bobby, is that you? Her voice sounded worried and scared. Bobby didn't reply. He didn't know what to say. He had hoped she wouldn't have been home and that she'd still be at the hospital working, allowing him some time to get some clothes and leave without a trace, and that she'd assume he was just another victim. She approached the back door and pulled it open. Her face turned white as she saw her boyfriend covered head to toe in human blood standing in front of her. She was frozen in fear. She had seen a lot being a paramedic, but it wasn't what she was seeing that she was afraid of. It was the immediate realization of what had happened at the hospital and how Bobby was behind it. Bobby began to tear up. I didn't want you to see me like this. I didn't want you to see me as this monster I've become. He collapsed into her as he started to sob, smearing blood all over her clothes and skin. She wrapped her arms around him. I'm sorry, baby. I came home as soon as I couldn't find you at the hospital. I figured you'd come here. Her voice shook. This is your fault. If you hadn't given me that blood, we'd still be fine. I would have never known how good other people's blood can taste, Bobby yelled. You just had to go and be impatient. Sam, fearing for her life, pushed Bobby away and ran into the house, trying to close the door behind her. Bobby quickly recovered from her shove and wedged himself between the door and the doorway, forcing his way in and knocking Sam to the floor. Please, Bobby, you don't have to do this. You love me. Remember you love me. She screamed frantically. I love your blood. Bobby tried pouncing on her, 
but she rolled out of the way and sprinted towards the bathroom. He pursued her, but she managed to get the door shut and locked this time before he could get to her. Bobby banged on the door as hard as possible to attempt to force it open, while Sam screamed and pleaded for him to stop. She looked around for anything to defend herself, and underneath the bathtub, she spotted the silver letter opener she had bought him to reward him for publishing his first book. Bobby was just about to enter the door as she dove for the knife. The door flew open and Bobby pounced on her again. This time he wouldn't miss, but neither would she. The silver blade of the letter opener plunged straight into Bobby's heart. He felt the cold burn of the silver puncture his heart as he rolled out from on top of her. He began to hear sirens and the screeching of tires. His vision began to fade to black as blood pooled beneath him, turning the white and blue floor tiles red once again. The last thing he saw was Sam's terrified, heartbroken face. I'm sorry. My love. And now, from author D.B. Anthony, I give you... Blood. You've been listening to Blood by D.B. Anthony. That's it for this week, folks. I know it was a quick one, but if I'm not mistaken, I think that we have two stories for you next week, so be sure to tune in at the same bat time, same bat channel. Thank you so much for tuning in this evening. I'm your host, Eric Peabody, and I'll see you right here at the same time next week. After all, we're moving closer and closer to Halloween, so it would be a shame to drop out now, don't you think? If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page, or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts, and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to me. If you'd like to hear a premium, ad-free edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program, all of our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. Thanks so much for your time and for giving our sponsors a try today. When you support our sponsors, you help support this show, and that means a lot to me. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. As for me personally, you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube username Viking Guitar, and also on Instagram as Viking Guitar Productions. Until next week, listener, when we meet up once again atop the Horror Hill for yet another Dance with Dark... And now, a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. If you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, accessible, affordable, and entirely online. You get matched with a therapist after filling out a brief survey and can switch therapists at any time. That's why BetterHelp works for me and so many others. Since starting, I've found myself calmer, more mentally confident, and, dare I say it, less stressed. BetterHelp is a real, professional counseling tailored to your needs that you can do online. It's more affordable than traditional therapy, and for those who need it, financial aid is available. 
meaning the people who need it most can have better access to help that's, well, better. Thanks to BetterHelp, it's never been easier to care for your mental health. All you have to do is take the first step. Most anyone can benefit from counseling, both professionals and do-it-yourselfers. Whether you need to unload stress, get emotional healing, or help with anxiety and depression, BetterHelp is the tried and true tool to get you up to task again. This is no gimmick, folks. It's professional therapy online. Quick, discreet, convenient, and at a price that's attainable. Here's how it works. Within 48 hours of signing up, you'll be communicating with your own licensed therapist who specializes in your specific needs. You can reach out anytime and receive timely, thoughtful responses. You can also schedule weekly phone or video sessions at your convenience. In short, you'll never be winging it again. Your professional counselor will always be close at hand. No office visits necessary. It's professional help right in your pocket. And remember, you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash horror hill today to get 10% off your first month. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash horror hill. Thank you for your support and for supporting our valuable sponsors. I bid you good night. Sleep tight, listener. And whatever you do, if you hear scratching at your door, don't open it. The darkness may have found you, but it's up to you to let it in. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's episode was hosted by, and its featured tale performed by, yours truly, Eric Peabody. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Nikki McSorley and Eric Peabody. Finalization by Craig Groshek and S.K. Brown. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your work considered for future production. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, please subscribe to us to make sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on social media to connect any time and get the latest updates on this and our other programs. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every week. And don't forget to hit the thumbs up button to let us know how we're doing and leave us a kind comment. Lastly, don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archives and ad-free downloads of all of your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, you can hear more of my work on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights podcast. However, I will be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you're after, listener, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. 
the darkness has found you. Dark Knight.